Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the latest in our series of ENO Center for Transportation webinars. Each year, ENO monitors and tracks some of the major transportation ballot measures um, going on in the country in the run-up to the November election, and this year is certainly no exception. There are several major ballot measures uh, planned across the country up for up to uh, uh, voters uh, to decide in a couple of weeks, and among those is the Get Moving initiative in the Portland region. Uh, if approved, this payroll tax measure would fund hundreds of transit, safety, and roadway improvements, including a new light, a new light rail line, rapid regional bus network, bridge replacements, and pedestrian bicycle infrastructure along 17 primary corridors. Today, we'll be discussing and learning more about the uh, Get Moving initiative with Tyler Frisbee. Tyler is a senior policy manager for Oregon Metro, which is the Greater Portland Area's regional government. She specializes in transportation and land use issues, but works broadly on regional governance affairs and policy issues uh, throughout the Portland area. Today, Tyler is going to provide an overview of the history of the measure, details on some of the proposed projects and funding mechanisms, and discuss how COVID-19 factored into the region's ballot measure planning. As a reminder and disclaimer, ENO doesn't endorse or support specific uh, ballot measures or legislation. Um, and the focus of these webinars is uh, just to talk through the history and details of these measures um, and just understand how regions across the country are handling initiatives and um, planning um, for uh, future investments um, in the wake of the pandemic. We'll have plenty of time for questions at the end, so please enter them into the question box on the side of your screen at any time, and we'll be sure to get to as many as we can after the presentation. And with that, I will hand it over to Tyler. Thank you so much, Ramek. Uh, good morning to my colleagues on the West Coast. Good afternoon to uh, friends on the East Coast and happy lunch to everyone in between. Uh, thanks for having me here. I'm really excited to talk about the work that Metro and our partners and the region as a whole did to put together the Get Moving proposal. Um, as uh, like Ramek, I do have to do a slight disclaimer, which is um, that since this measure is referred to the ballot, uh, as a public employee uh, and public servant, I can speak neutrally and factually about the contents of the measure. Um, today, I'm mostly gonna focus on the process that we went through to develop it, uh, which gives me, I can speak a little bit more um, expansively about the work that was done, but particularly during the Q&A, um, I may have to answer in a more limited fashion. I'm happy to have follow-up conversations with people um, if necessary. So, but just know that if I, I seem like I'm being very cautious in my response. Um, that is why I just want to respect the rules that our Secretary of State asked us to follow. So uh, what is the Get Moving proposal? Um, it is, the Get Moving proposal is a uh, $5.2 billion proposal for the Portland metro area. That's Portland and the 24 cities and three counties surrounding the city. Um, and it will help, as Ramek said, it will help build a light rail line from downtown Portland down to the southwest part of our region, one of the fastest growing parts of the region. It will help build our first rapid bus network, connecting some of our fastest growing employment areas with our residential areas. Uh, and it invests in 86 miles of our region's most dangerous streets, uh, in particular places where we know people of color are very likely to be hit or killed um, while using the transportation system. So it is, um, in addition to those investments, it also has a series of program, programmatic investments that I'll talk about that are ongoing investments over 20 years to help do things like make sure that people can afford to live near these transportation investments, um, reduce the cost of using the transit system, uh, support Safe Routes to Schools program, et cetera. I will talk about all that uh, content um, towards the end of this, and the, um, but I'm gonna start sort of talking about the background and how we got into this. So in 2018, our, so our Metro Council, which is a directly elected council um, made to representing the region, the Portland region as a whole, they said, look, we know our region is struggling and dealing with unprecedented growth. Like many other urban areas across the country, um, we were having um, thousands of people move here each month. We were dealing with increased housing and unaffordability. Uh, our traffic was much worse. Our buses were overcrowded and running late. More and more people were being hit and killed on our streets. Um, and all of the things that we really love and treasure about the Portland area, people felt like they were being threatened. 
Uh, and Portland had taken some steps. They, uh, the city of Portland had passed a city gas tax just the year before. Um, I wanna give major kudos to the Portland team um, out there. And the city had also passed a housing afforda affordable bo affordability bond. But these were regional issues. Um, for us, our, our friends and colleagues in Beaverton and Hillsboro and uh, the, the suburbs around Portland were dealing with these issues just as much as the city. And so uh, we knew and we were getting interest from our government partners across the region in a broader regional approach. So in 2018, our council developed and referred an affordable housing bond, the first ever regional affordable housing bond in the country. Um, that passed and it will provide homes for 12,000 people in the Portland region. Even in the middle of the pandemic, we just had a ribbon cutting a couple of weeks ago uh, for 100, over 100 units um, in one of our Washington County, our Western suburb um, cities. So that was very exciting. In 2019, uh, we passed a renewal of our parks uh, program, a, a bond for our parks program. So that is to help ensure that people have access to open space, that we're protecting open space, and that we're investing in clean air, clean water, and wildlife habitat, even as our region grows. The, the parks bonds have actually been one of the consistent ballot measures that the Metro Council has put out to people of the region over the last 10 years. So this was a renewal, which is different. Everything else that I'm gonna talk about today is the first time it's gone out to the voters. Uh, then in May of this year, our council referred a supportive housing services uh, measure focused on helping people who are homeless or living on the streets um, find the services that they need to be able to get a roof over their head and keep a roof over their head. Uh, that was on the May ballot this year and passed and we are now in the process of implementing it. And then finally, our council said, um, the last piece we want you to pursue is a transportation measure. We know that that's gonna be the hardest um, because there are a lot of opinions in our region about what transportation should look like. Um, and it's likely the biggest. Uh, it is, uh, and it has turned out to be by a factor of 10. Um, they also said, we know that it's the most, one of the most necessary. Um, this is an, the, the transportation issues are not city by city, even in, in a way that is more intense um, than housing. We know these roads connect our cities, so you can't expect one city to bear all the burden of fixing these roads and making them work better. Uh, and we know that transportation truly is about moving people around our region, um, and these investments are desperately needed. So. We, all of these measures, um, of course, took a, a, a lot of time um, and engagement between the government affairs team and the planning and development department and the parks department, respectively. Um, but the transportation measure was the longest process. We, um, we really started it in 2018 uh, when council asked us to think about this comprehensive package. Uh, council also asked us at the time um, to make sure that all of the work that we were doing, all of the measures, we're deeply rooted in serving people. Uh, and that is something that came naturally, I would say, for our housing team. Um, I think uh, it's really about, you know, how many people can you help find housing? How many roofs can you provide so that people have a place to live? Um, and for the parks team, it was really, for them, it really came down to thinking about how do you help people have access to nature and open space? For transportation, that helped push us to think a little bit differently about the processes and the way that we developed things. Um, so that we were engaging with community members in a really different way and getting their specific feedback on what they wanted, what was working for them in the transportation system, what wasn't working. Um, and it made us think a lot about how we got um, everyday people's ex experiences and feedback into the development of the measure. And so I'll talk about that. But I think it's really important. Um, and I also want to flag and say thank you to our communications and engagement team, Karen Fish, Craig Beebe, um, and Molly Cooney-Mesker, who did a really incredible job, I think, of making sure we were communicating about transportation in a way um, that was accessible to people, that didn't talk about BMT or transit mode share, um, but talked about, you know, where do you wanna go? What do you need to do? Um, and that was really important throughout that process. It's a hard thing for those of us who are trans, uh, transportation nerds, but it really matters. So. Um, always be really nice to your comms people. In 20, early 2019, we went to our council um, to formally begin sort of the, the develop the policy framework for the transportation measure. And our council said, we want this to focus on three 
main um, goals. And we want it to be grounded in the Regional Transportation Plan, uh, which is a federally required document that every MPO does. Anyone who works for an MPO, um, you probably spend more time developing your Regional Transportation Plan than you want to admit. Um, but it identifies what are the needs in the region, what's working, what isn't working, and what are the things we want to build over the next 20 to 40 years. And our regional transportation plan also outlines high level policies and transportation goals and land use goals for the region. So they said, we just finished uh, developing the RTP. We spent two and a half years on it. We want to make sure that this measure is grounded in the needs that the RTP has identified, that it aligns with the RTP policies, um, and that we're using the work and um, the energy that went in into to that to help inform the measure. They also said we really want to make sure that this measure is grounded in the region's climate smart strategy. This is a document that our region adopted in 2014, uh, and it identifies how um, the region was going to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions from the transportation sector. Uh, this was a mandated by the state. They asked us to do this. We asked them to ask us to do this, really, um, in order for us as a region to say, OK, we know transportation is one of our biggest contributors to GHG in the region. What does it look like for us to really do that work? Um, and so our council said we want to make sure the investments that are outlined in the Climate Smart Strategy are investments that are considered and part of the measure. That really came down to investments in transit and investments in biking and walking. The other two major strategies that are outlined in Climate Smart are pricing and switching to cleaner fuels, both of which are really important for reducing GHG emissions, as everyone on this call knows, uh, but are not super popular at the ballot. Uh, taking congestion pricing to the ballot uh, is not a recommended strategy. So we really focus on what are the investments, what are the foundational things that we need to develop in order uh, to be ready to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions um, and tackle the other strategies that are in Climate Smart um, so that we're ready as a region and we're able to take on the responsibilities we have around climate. And then finally, the last document that Council asked us to really focus on is our strategic plan to advance racial equity, diversity, and inclusion. This is slightly different from the other two because it is agency-wide for us. It's not just focused on transportation or land use or housing. It's focused on land use, transportation, housing, parks, uh, solid waste and recycling, um, and economic development. Um, but this is a foundational document. Um, for us, it really drove us to focus on making sure this measure disproportionately benefited people of color um, given and that we took um, that we were actively working to repair harm done by previous transportation investments and uh, improve the quality of life for people of color. So I'll talk a little bit more about what that looks like, um, but it that was a key focus for us and very helpful to have that grounding. I will say one of the things we really learned through this process um, is it is really helpful to make sure when you are doing things like your regional transportation plan, um, if you're a city, things like your CIP, um, making sure that those are done in a way that can be helpful for future investment measures or investment needs. So. When we had worked on our regional transportation plan, we, we knew it was gonna show that we were way behind in terms of meeting our safety goals, our congestion goals, our transit goals, our climate goals, and that we were way behind in terms of the investment that our region needed. And so we thought there was a chance that at some point we might be going out for a ballot measure. Um, and so uh, we, did, we made sure we were doing really detailed um, analysis and data analysis so that we knew what the region needed. And in particular, I wanna give a shout out to my colleague, Grace Cho, who did incredible equity analysis in our regional transportation plan, looking at what are the, what are the needs of people of color from our transportation system? How are they not being served? Um, and what do they need in order for the system to work for them? And Grace, I think, led a work group uh, over a year and a half um, doing really deep engagement and analysis to help figure out the things that um, the people of color in our region need in order for the transportation system to work for them. There is no way that we would have had time to do that analysis and do that work in the two years that we put together this measure. So it was incredibly helpful to have that done and ready to use 
um, for the transportation measure itself. It's also incredibly critical in all sorts of other work that we do as a region um, and is very applicable uh, across the board. But it, I will say in this one, there were so many times when we just said, oh, thank you, Grace, um, for doing this work. And so uh, my planning director always likes to say, good planning work is good planning work, however it is used. And that is very true. Uh, and I think one of the things we really learned is that sort of well done, thoughtful analysis and analysis plus engagement. When it's done well for the work that you have to do as an MPO or as a city, it pays off in dividends um, once you start, if you start working on an investment measure. We also um, knew politically that there were a lot of people coming into this conversation who had very specific projects that they wanted funded out of this measure. And we didn't want this conversation to just turn into a fight about my project's better than your project. Um, we wanted it to really be grounded in the values and the things that we were trying to deliver for the people of this region. So um, we did a lot of work with the ta our task force, which I'll talk about in a little bit, and with our council. Um, and with some of our key community partners to understand what are the values that we want this transportation measure to deliver on? What are the things that we should be thinking about as we're making decisions? And that was really helpful for getting people to come to the table and put aside their pet project or at least tuck it slightly lower in their brain um, and be able to have a conversation about what do we really need? What do we need to deliver for the people of the region? And so it's super touchy feely. We did, a, we did, I would say probably three or four task force sessions that were just having people put values up on post-it notes around the wall, have, doing tons of storytelling, having people come in and tell their stories about getting around the region. And you have to be willing to do that touchy feely work, I think, in order for people to connect on a deeper level and be really willing to make some hard choices because otherwise everyone just comes in and wants to talk about their project um, and their city and the things that you know they want rather than what is, what do we really need to deliver so uh we after our council gave us direction on those using those three foundational documents they also said we, you know, as part of delivering on our racial equity strategy, we need to do the development of this measure in a different way. It can't just be the mayors um, of our region sitting around and saying what they want. And it can't just be sort of a bunch of keys, the traditional transportation stakeholders figuring out what, you know, what they're going to fight about and what compromises they're willing to make. And so one of the things that we did and we, um, it was a lot of work and it was worth it a thousand times over we had a transportation funding task force made up of 35 members a third of them were business leaders a third were community leaders and a third were elected leaders from around the region and these people were rock stars they met 23 times um, over the course of a year and a half and they advised the council on everything from what should be in the measure what our priorities should be what our values should be um, where we should focus investment, what revenue mechanisms we should use, and what accountability and oversight mechanisms we should use. So they were totally amazing. Um, most of them were also not transportation professionals. And so that meant that we had to do a lot of background work and um, sessions learning like, okay, what is the climate smart strategy? Um, what does it mean when we talk about, what does it mean, what do you have to do to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from transportation? Um, what does it mean when we talk about vision zero? And that was hard. Um, it took a lot of time, but I will say it was 100% worth it in the end. And these folks really came together. This photo that you have that um, is on the slide is their unanimous recommendation about uh, the projects on the corridors um, that they wanted to see invested in. And so that was really helpful. From a process perspective, they were an advisory committee. Um, so the, you know, the buck stops with the Metro Council, which is the council, you know, the set of people who had to refer the measure to the ballot. And that was helpful because um, I think it would have been too much pressure for the task force if they knew that they were making the final decision, the binding decision. Um, but the things that they recommended, council always always essentially acted on them. So that that was a dynamic that worked well. Data, data, data. Um, so there's these are a few of, I think, the 17 maps that our task force ended up using in various decision making processes. Uh, and one of the things that I want to start with is our overall approach to the measure. Uh, like I said, in a, a couple of failed attempts at building measures in the past, our region 
had basically put a bunch of projects on the table and sort of had people fight about which project was better. And we knew that wasn't going to work this time around. And a lot of folks on this call might know our council president, Lynn Peterson, who's a former WashDOT secretary. Um, and she deeply wanted us to take a corridor approach. And that meant that instead of picking projects, we first started with picking corridors in the region that we needed to invest in. And then we picked projects on those corridors. And that is great from a transportation perspective. All of us transportation nerds are like, oh my gosh, that makes so much sense. You can do these small projects and then they all come together and you get a really big impact. Otherwise you wouldn't fund those small projects. Um, and it is super great from a transportation perspective and I am really happy we did it. Uh, but I will say it, it is a pain in the butt during the, process, during the process of developing the measure because you're basically asking people to commit to focusing on certain corridors when they don't fully know what projects are going to be on those corridors and so that was painful for folks you know we had folks being like well i totally want to invest in this corridor if we're going to do brt on it but i don't want to invest in it if we're going to add an auxiliary lane and you're like i know just trust the process and move through it um so that was hard i think it was worth it in the end but if anyone is interested in doing a deeper dive on this approach i'm happy to talk one-on-one -on -one. uh we also did, because we're a super nerdy MPO and this is what we do, I, I think we overloaded folks with data. In some ways it was really helpful. Um, you know, our task force members and the community members that we engaged and the community organizations who are our partners in this um, can rattle off information about equity focus areas and statistics about where people are being hit and killed. You know, 70% of people hit and killed on our roadways are people of color. Um, they, they have, great data because they went through all of this. Um, they pushed us for different types of data um, and all those things. That was really helpful. Also, sometimes you get stuck in the space of people just wanting more and more data instead of making a decision. And sometimes you just have to say, okay, we're not like, we can create another map for you, but that's not gonna change the outcome. You have to make a decision now. And that's always a hard moment. Um, but eventually people are willing to make a decision and sort of look at all the things they had. But I will say, it's very helpful to help people understand what their decisions are grounded in. So we gave them maps of congestion. Uh, in, in our region, we focus on, on duration of congestion. We assume that most roads will be congested during peak hour. But the question is, are they congested for longer than peak hour? Because that's where you really start to have a negative impact on freight, um, on commerce, uh, and on people being able to sort of live their daily lives. So we gave them maps of congestion and duration of congestion. We gave them safety maps. We gave them maps of the key freight routes. We gave them maps um, our, of our equity focus areas. We gave them crash maps. We gave them uh, population growth and uh, job growth maps. So they were, they, they were very immersed in the data. Uh, we also knew, in addition to our task force, that we needed to upend some of our old transportation decision-making structures if we really wanted this measure to represent the people of the region and if we wanted people to feel like they were engaged in the decision-making. Um, the way traditionally that most of our transportation funding has been decided in the region is at uh, our regional advisory table, our joint policy advisory committee on transportation, um, which is made up of mayors and key um, leaders from around the region, um, business leader, our business leaders and agency leaders. And then each of our three counties has a transportation decision making table made up of mayors who decide the funding priorities for their county. We knew that that wasn't fair, it wasn't equitable, it shut out the voices of people of color, and it really meant that we couldn't engage a broader swath of community leaders and, and neighbor, neighbors and folks who live here. So we developed local investment teams for each county, which were made up of community leaders, um, no electeds and uh, no sort of, uh, no electeds or no like traditional transportation stakeholders. So neighborhood organizers, um, moms, parents, um, community leaders, that kind of thing. And we did, we took them on trips. Um, they would get in a bus, and this was what we spent the summer of 2019 doing. They would get on a bus, drive uh, the road that they were looking at, look at some of the key issues. We would have um, an engineer talk about some of the key challenges, and then they would come back and they would talk about, well, you know, in my experience, you guys are proposing a crosswalk here, but the real issue is down here, or 
um, you know, this is really focused on X, but I really think you need to focus on Y. And that was eye opening. It changed a lot of the projects that we were considering on these corridors. It helped connect, frankly, a lot of our regional staff, their engineers, their planning leaders um, with community members who they didn't know. And um, it also really helped shift the conversation so that it wasn't about, you know, what's the project that a certain mayor or county leader has wanted for 10 or 15 years, but what's the project that people who live there right now want to see? And so I totally, it's a lot of work, um, but I really recommend if you are thinking about an investment measure, don't just assume you should use the structures that you have now. Think about how you connect um, the needs of the people that you are serving um, with the projects that you're thinking about. And it's really fun to get creative. It's a ton of work, um, but you will build relationships. You will learn about the needs of your, um, your public and you will hear things that you would never have expected. So highly recommend it. It was very fun. Um, we also knew that we had to do really deep engagement uh, and that that engagement, again, had to go sort of beyond the traditional transportation stakeholders. So we did a bunch of survey responses. We actually got shockingly high numbers of digital responses um, for our region. We did tons of forums and commenters, um, tons of forums and workshops, many which were hosted and led by culturally specific community organizations um, or folks, disability rights advocates, um, folks like AARP or um, you know parents at certain schools would host uh, forums and workshops for us. That worked incredibly well in terms of being able to let folks sort of touch and feel all of the pieces we were working on. We also uh, contracted with five uh, community organizations to do deep engagement um, on the measure with their members, and that was really helpful. I, um, both because you know there is a understandable distrust of government in a lot of circles. And so having community orgs lead that conversation, um, helping fund them so that they have the capacity to reach out to more people, um, making sure that they had you know, the translation services they need, the materials, the presentations, um, the community organizations who led these conversations were just phenomenal and were able to engage with their membership in ways that were really deep um, and more productive, I think, than if it had been government led. That is also deeply aligned with our racial equity strategy, which really wants to put people of color in decision-making positions. So that um, we were really happy with how that turned out and really proud of the work um, and grateful to the community organizations who worked with us to do that. Um, I will also say you can never do enough uh, presentations. So we did in the last two months, um, we did over 100 present stakeholder presentations about the final content of the measure. If I did it again, I would have done it that sort of blitz of presentations a couple other times during the development. So all of that work and engagement and conversation and feedback resulted in 17 major corridors in our region. And as you can see, these corridors are really focused um, on connecting places where we're having major residential and employment growth. Um, they are also focused on places where we have major safety issues. Uh, they are also regional connectors. So one of the things we heard from the task force in terms of finances is, Look, the state and the federal government are responsible for our freeway and our interstate system. We can't ask the people of the region to pay um, for those when those really should be state and federal responsibilities. The people of this region should be focusing on the regional connectors that otherwise don't have a chance at getting any funding. So uh, a lot of these are orphan highways, for those of you who are familiar with that term. Um, essentially, they are owned by the state, but they don't see the type of investment that they need because they're not part of the freeway or highway system. Um, and they are uh, heavily traveled places where we know growth is happening, where people live right now, um, and where generally we are also lacking in transportation options. Um, the projects on those corridors overall, I'm gonna move kind of quickly through these slides, but it's about 120 miles of roadway improvements and an additional 60 miles of roadway planning. We heard from folks they wanted us not only to think about the issues now, but make sure that we're planning for the future. 25 to 30 miles of new bus lanes. Um, we are, Portland as a region is very behind on bus lanes and thinking about how we move buses quickly through transit. This, uh, right now we have about two and a half miles of bus lanes. So this will uh, increase that number by a factor of 10. 
260 traffic signal improvements and transit priority signals. 11 miles of a new max line, a new light rail line connecting downtown Portland with key emerging population centers. And then we heard a lot about the need for safety. So 40 to 45 miles of new sidewalk, walk, 4,000 new streetlights and 280 crosswalks. Uh, we know these investments are also heavily weighted towards um, locations where we have a high percentage of people of color uh, living and working there. So 55% of our sidewalk miles um, and our new crosswalks are in areas that are predominant, um, where there's a predominant uh, population of people of color, 68% of our new streetlights, and 55% of our improved bike lanes. One of the things that came out during our uh, engagement too was also people wanted to have flexible funding available off of the corridors um, to meet uh, transportation needs as they evolve and also to address potential displacement and housing issues as these investments went forward. So some of the, um, the measure now has $4.2 billion worth of capital projects on the 17 corridors that you saw the map of. And then it has 10 programs, um, which in total will get $50 million of funding a year over the next 20 years. And so those programs, uh, one is an anti-displacement strategy. So for each of the corridors that we're investing in, bringing community and business leaders together to identify the things that they will need um, in that part of the region to be able to uh, withstand the transportation improvements. This is essentially looking at, we know that often transportation improvements can bring gentrification and can bring displacement um, can, and can result in people either not feeling welcome in their community or not being able to afford to live in their community. What are the policies, what are the investments that we need to avoid that so that the people who live on these corridors now can enjoy the transportation benefits that are coming and stay there long after they're in place. Uh, so we have specific funding set aside for that. We also have additional funding set aside to preserve and, um, and buy affordable housing and uh, maintain its affordability on the corridors that we're investing in to make sure that people can continue to live there. We also have a Safe Routes to Schools program, a Safety Hotspots program, uh, a Better Bus program, which is looking at what are targeted transit improvements you can do to reduce transit delay. Uh, this measure will electrify our entire bus system, which has been a key priority for a lot of our environmental leaders for a long time, our transit um, agency is actually the state's largest diesel user in the state right now. Um, it, the measure, one of the key things from the community was they really wanted to provide free transit for youth. And so it took a lot of work to figure out how to do that in a way that was effective, that was um, functional, that didn't negatively impact service. Uh, but this measure will provide uh, free transit for people 18 and under. Uh, we're also proposing some investments in local main streets for some of our smaller communities to make sure they're accessible and safe. Uh, we have a regional trails program, and then we have some additional funds set aside for future corridor planning as necessary. Uh, one of the things, oops, let me go back. Um, Ramik asked us a little bit to talk about, you know, how did things change with COVID? One of the things I will say is uh, throughout the process of most of this measure's development, Unemployment and job growth was not an issue. The Portland area was booming. Um, and then we hit March and suddenly unemployment and job growth became critical. Uh, we went from unemployment being something that 14% of our population was worried about to something that 87% of our population was worried about. Um, so that is a huge shift. And so you'll, you'll see if you look back at some of our early messaging, we don't really talk about you know, transportation investments and job growth, transportation investments and economic growth. Uh, we talk a lot more about worries about displacement, um, making sure that there's affordable housing. And uh, then in March, we shift because, you know, there is, there's direct job growth and there's indirect job growth. Um, and so that messaging really changed for us starting in March. And I think it's really important. Uh, our region and our state and frankly, our country have traditionally invested in transportation infrastructure uh, when we are in times of economic uncertainty. And that's because it allows you to rebuild your economy at the same time as you are rebuilding your transportation system. And that's what uh, this measure may be able to do for the Portland region. Paying for it, this is always a tough question. Um, and I should say most of the folks on this call, you are probably lucky enough to enjoy the, the option of a sales tax. Um, Oregon does not have a sales tax. We are one of two states in the country. The Metro could, um, we have the legal authority to impose a sales tax, but 
it pulls, it's just slightly more unpopular than congestion pricing. Uh, so it is not a winner. Um, and so we looked at a series of mechanisms in most of the conversations we had leading up to this measure, um, the conversations with the business community, they were interested in, in a uh, corporate activity tax, uh, which is a little bit similar to a VAT, honestly, not implemented the same way, um, but sort of that's an easy way to think about it. Um, and then in, in 2019, our legislature uh, applied a corporate activity tax uh, across the state to help fund schools and education. And then in doing so, they preempted any state or, or any other local government from using a corporate activity tax to fund um, any local needs. So that option was no longer an option for us. Um, and in the conversations that we had starting in 2020 with the business community, the payroll tax became the best option. We'll say that's an employer-based payroll tax. Um, we heard very strong feedback from our community leaders that an employee-based payroll tax was not an acceptable option. Uh, so as folks all know, the sort of major questions when you're looking at how to pay for something is, uh, is it accessible? Like legally, can you do it? Um, and is it relatively easy to implement? I think that was another question for us. There were a bunch of other options, um, but we would have spent a lot on implementation. Is it viable? Uh, is the public open to using it? You're sending something to the ballot, so you have to really think about, is the public willing to let you use uh, this mechanism? And then is it sufficient? Can you raise enough using this? We had a lot of great other um, ideas that were not sufficient. Um, they would not have raised enough money. So we went with the payroll tax um, in the conversations we had, were having with the business community in January and February and early March. They were really pleased. They actually, we have letters from them asking us to use that um, and supporting that use. When the economy changed in March, um, they became a lot more skittish about that. We, had se we have several key business um, leaders, some of the larger employers in the region who are now opposing the measure because they are not comfortable with the use of a payroll tax. Um, they say that given the uncertainty in COVID, they're not comfortable using that. Um, so that is a challenge. I will say no taxing mechanism is perfect and no taxing mechanism is universally popular, um, but it turns out these things aren't free um, and you have to sort of try to find what works, what are people willing to pay for um, and what, you know, what will provide enough funding. So that was, I will say, one of the bigger changes from COVID is the change in the business community's openness uh, to potentially paying for transportation. It's always a little bit hard to tell um, how much is COVID and how much is just sort of the reality of businesses saying, oh, you're actually going to move forward with this. Because um, when we've talked to folks, we're not implementing it until 2022. Um, so they'll have two years before it would be implemented. Um, and we talk with them about further delays. Uh, but that was not sufficient, or not what they wanted. So um, it's hard to sort of know, is this really COVID or is this really just dealing with the reality of having to pay for something? Um, so with that, our council, that was sort of our final conversations in May and June is finalizing the projects, um, making sure that our programs um, were, that we, we're ready to implement implement them that we knew how to implement them and coming around to a funding mechanism that worked for people uh, and our council referred the measure to the ballot in mid-july which is late i would say normally in a non-covid year we would have wanted to refer in uh april or or in may um, but given covid the last three months of four months of this were done entirely online it changed a lot of our engagement um, it meant, you know, a lot of our community partners needed more time to finish the engagement that they wanted to do. Uh, and I will say we were deeply grateful to end up having a little, little bit more time and being able to go in July. So one learning lesson from COVID for us was be willing to be flexible on time. A July referral worked out really well and let our partners finish a lot of the work that they needed to do. Um, we also used that time to do a lot of extra public opinion work. And I will say, um, I think folks on this call, you've probably experienced this. You know, the immediate needs for people um, became immediately like public health safety and the economy. But the other things that they were concerned about, being able to get around housing affordability, um, those are still really key concerns and they're things that people still are worried about. Um, and what we found consistently in our conversations with people is they believe that 
um, when we go back to when, you know, when we have a vaccine and our life returns to, um, you know, something that much more resembles pre-COVID times, they believe that the challenges we were facing then will still be around. We haven't suddenly solved traffic. We haven't suddenly solved homelessness. Um, we hadn't, haven't suddenly solved clean air and clean water. And now is a time when they feel deeply connected to their community. Maybe it's um, wistfulness or nostalgia, but they really want to think that we are investing to make these places better. And so that was helpful for us and think in understanding people still care about this. Um, they still believe that they want to be a part of making their community stronger and more resilient and ready for the future. And the public still wants to see government take action. Um, it can't all be COVID all the time. So that was very helpful um, and reassuring, I think, for our council as they considered whether or not to refer this is knowing that people um, are willing to put a down payment on their future at this time. So with that, I am wrapped up. Ramek, do we want to move to questions? Yes. Um, so thank you so much, Tyler. Um, great segue into a couple of the questions that we got. Um, starting out with one quick uh, question, uh, mostly about um, how the payroll tax is structured and what the tax rate is. Um, and then after that, if we could um, talk a bit about, I know you mentioned the, the, uh, some of the concerns from the business community, but we got a couple of questions about um, you know, voter sentiment um, and community engagement. And, and if you've noticed any, um, you know, changes or, um, you know, new dynamics post COVID once the measure was referred. Yeah. Um, great questions. I, I probably can't talk a ton about post referral, but, um, I will do my best to answer all of those. So our tax structure, it is a 0.75% tax, um, on employer payroll. Uh, so that is um, less than 1% of what employee of what employers spend on payroll. Um, and we exempted any company with 25 or fewer employees. Uh, and we do not have the legal authority to tax state and local governments. So uh, the exemption we was based um, throughout the process, we heard a strong push from the business community, make sure that we're not, um, you know, punishing smaller businesses or making things harder for smaller businesses that became more um, important, I think, in COVID times as you know, larger businesses have the capital and the reserves to weather this better um, than the smaller businesses. And so that was very important to our council. And then um, it, what that means is it's actually fewer than 10% of the companies in our region will be responsible for paying this tax. Uh, so, it is, it's a much smaller group of, of companies and corporations who will um, be supporting this funding. And then, uh, as I said, we do not have the legal authority to tax uh, state and local governments. So um, that is removed from, from the payroll tax mechanism. We will implement the tax in 2022. That was a decision by our council to give the economy a little bit of time to recover. But the plus is that lets us bond and actually start building projects in 2021. So the intention there was to be able to start providing jobs early before the tax is implemented. Uh, and I should say that we actually very carefully wrote the language so that the tax rate is up to um, 0.75. Our council can set that lower. They can choose to phase it in slowly over time. Um, or if as you know, if they started at 0.7 and we're actually bringing in more money than we anticipate, uh, we could keep it at 0.7, we could drop it to 0.65, we could drop it to 0.6. So we really wanted to make sure that we were uh, protecting our options um, to minimize the impact to companies as much as possible. And so, yeah. um, I oh, go ahead. I'll just say from an implementation perspective, uh, we will, we have an agreement with the state um, if, and so they, if the measure is to pass, the state would be, will collect it on Metro's behalf. Got it. And so another, as I mentioned, one of the, the questions we've gotten, I know you're, you're limited on what you can touch on post-referral, um, is, you know, we talked through some of the, the back and forth with the business community in terms of, um, you know, sentiment about funding mechanisms. Um, what were some of the, um, you know, public concerns or feedback that you um, got as you were, um, you know, towards the end stages of the, the funding portion? Um, and to what extent can you touch on, um, you know, post-COVID, um, you know, how post-COVID dynamics factored into uh, community feedback? 
Yeah. Um, I love even thinking about post COVID, but uh, post COVID, you know, when, after COVID began, uh, we're still in COVID times. From our community leaders, um, you know, in addition to COVID, we are also in a real racial justice um, moment. And that has been, I think, you know, it's very pronounced across the region. But in Portland, um, we have had over 100 days of protests. Um, they had a, over a 100 day streak before we had the wildfires here where they, they paused due to major public health concerns. But um, I think our leaders of color and our are feeling uh, em, emboldened as they should and um, that this is a time for them to push for some of the justice and some of the reparations that um, and some of the investments that have been um, lacking or frankly, in many cases, harmful uh, to their community. How do we ask for reparations for the work that has been done? And so our community leaders are really in really, this measure is really important to them. They feel like this measure focuses on the needs of people of color. It's delivering on investments on a whole bunch of key corridors and roads that they've been asking for, for investments for 10, 15, 20 years, places like 82nd, 122nd, uh, 162nd, uh, TV Highway. These are places um, that they have been asking for more funding, particularly safety and transit improvements for decades. And so, um, you know, I think they, have felt like this this measure is meeting their needs and this is a time when they can push and be really explicit about their needs. Um, our, the executive director of the Coalition of Communities of Color has been a really strong advocate for this measure. He sat on our task force. Some of our key community leaders, I wanna give a shout out to uh, Vivian Satterfield at Verde, um, Duncan at Apano, um, folks who were just engaged in this measure in really deep ways. Uh, Centro Cultural, our friends at Unite Oregon, um, they helped shape this measure. They helped direct and figure out where that funding needed to go. Um, and I think they feel ownership over it in a way that's really impressive and really, one, I will say as a, as a public servant, it's really gratifying and really wonderful um, and a great reminder of how much better and how much stronger these things are when we let people make the decisions and particularly people who have been shut out of the process. So. We, I would say we sort of have those two dynamics going on in our region right now um, on this measure and frankly on a couple of other things where uh, community leaders um, and particularly community leaders of color feel really strong ownership um, and believe that if you wanna say that Black Lives Matter, you have to invest um, in the things that Black Lives are asking for you to invest in. Um, and then we have companies who uh, are, don't want to pay the tax or are unhappy with the way things were put together and that is a it's a tough dynamic in our region but it's very real got it and so um i understand we're a little bit over time um and so i think this is a, a good stopping point um we could be here all day and um get into a lot of the nitty-gritty about um the, the measure and the um you know very robust um you know history behind this so um, I want to thank you again, Tyler, for joining us um, and, and sharing a lot of the history and detail about the measure. Um, as always, the recording for this webinar will be posted on our website shortly, and you will be able to access a, a recording. Um, and uh, as usual, stay tuned for we have a, a couple of other webinars um, coming up in the coming weeks and a few others uh, related to ballot measures that are um, in the pipeline. And so uh, thank you again, Tyler, for sharing your time with us. And um, we really appreciate it. And uh, looking forward to uh, staying engaged and uh, seeing uh, what happens in November. Yeah, thank you all. Um, my email is on this slide if anyone has follow-up um, or wants to reach out directly. Thank you. Take care, everyone.